My mission is simple, to make you money. I'm here to level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to Mad Money. Welcome to Kramerica. Other people want to make friends. I'm just trying to help you save some money. My job is not just to entertain, but to educate, put days like this in context because they're difficult. So call me at 1-800-743-CBC or tweet me at Jim Kramer. All right, look, the Fed's at war with inflation, and they didn't exactly win the battle with today's Consumer Price Index report at 8.30 this morning. Yep, we got another overheated CPI, not what they wanted, not as bad as last month, but way too well of it. When I talk about the Fed winning or losing the fight against inflation, I mean the fight to tamp down on expensive spending, allowing overset stretched supply chains to play catch up, easing some of the strain of the labor market, and of course, making it so it doesn't cost so much for dinner. So there's at least one front in this war where Jay Powell does keep winning, though. And it's one that you and I don't want to hear. It's one that is absolutely driving us crazy. He's winning the fight against the stock market. Or. Because remember, the stock market is an amazing source of funds to buy things, raise kids, retire with them, take vacations. And it's all being obliterated right before our eyes. Once again, the Dow lost another 327 points. S&P tumbled 1.65 percent. But the Nasdaq plunged 3.18 percent. And that is one of the more quiet but devastating bear sessions in recent history. It just kept dripping and dripping and dripping. Plus, we had more large cap disappointments just this evening. It's not letting up, and it is, as the late Jackie Gleason would say, a revolting development. And these are just the big averages. It's even more obvious when you look at the collapse of the IPO market and see the stocks in the Russell 1000, which contains the largest, thousand largest publicly traded companies in America. Within that index, we're witnessing the most extreme wealth destruction that we've seen since the dot-com bust in 2000, or maybe in 2008, 2009. I want to put this moment in perspective. So I asked CNBC's amazing statistician, Gina Francola, to come up with a list of the worst performers in the Russell 1000 since the Fed took away the punch bowl, and that was done last November. Now, some of these have gotten so small that I, I normally hesitate to mention them on air. But I think it's important to highlight them because I want you to get the complete picture. So let's start out with the biggest loser, and that's a company called Carvana, the digital used car retailer. For, for years, I loved Carvana's business model until it got too expensive. And I told him you, you had to sell it last summer. Good call. Carvana had already come down to 284 last November. Now it's at 30 after doing a giant secondary offering at 80 not long ago, just enough to raise money to stay in business. This 89% decline is now accompanied by the layoffs, as we learned today, of 2,500 people. Get used to hearing these kinds of numbers, people. I think they'll loom much larger after the Fed's next rate hike or two. Number two is Upstart. That was at 205 last November. It's now at 28, down 86. We had this AI-powered loan originator on last night. It was somewhat contentious. They talked about how well they've been growing, but because of their business model, they've been hurt by soaring interest rates. I was hoping Upstart would be more of a loan facilitator, a platform, rather than an actual lender. I thought they have what I call an asset light model. Not anymore. I begged them to get the loans off their books, but they seem sanguine about this part of the business. I am not sanguine. Like many, I had high hopes at one time for skills, S-K-I-L-Z, you know, well, you can see it. It's kind of I L L Z. That's a mobile gaming company that hosts casual esports contests. I thought that was a great business. I was wrong. We're in the parlance of Kathy Wood early. Skills has lost 85% of its value since November as business has dried up. That's because the company tried to give us what we've been asking for profitable growth, but it's nowhere near break even, so it can't do it. Skills is hemorrhaging money. The beauty of skills was you could wager on other people's video games while playing at home. The ugly of skills is that we're not stuck at home anymore. It was a total pandemic play after all. Number four is Unity Software. We've got them on the show tonight. It's a very well-run company. It makes tools for both game developers and the metaverse, or the omniverse. The stock was doing fabulously, but then Apple put through some privacy rules, clobbered their mobile business, and when you're, they also had a self-inflicted error, an engineer error, uh, when your stock goes from 177 to 30, that's an 83% decline. That is serious wealth destruction for many people. In other words, if you had a sizable position in Unity, you're a lot less likely to buy a new car or take a vacation to Italy. Unity is a real company that can turn a profit in the not too distant future. But anything connected to gaming is now in the doghouse as the world goes back to normal. Fifth, Rivian was supposed to be the 
best manufacturer, tens of thousands of electric delivery trucks, the kind of trucks Amazon desperately needs. Even Ford had a stake in it, too. But they watched the stock go from 118 last November to just under 30 last week. Then Ford sold 8 million shares over the weekend, putting even more pressure on the stock. Now Rivian's at 21. Turns out Ford was right to get out. Can you believe it? They still have tons left, though. The bag got worse. That's the story of this, of this market. Their numbers this very evening were terrible. Six, too simple, T-U-S-I-M-P-L, is another one that was too simple, but very cool-looking self-driving truck technology. The stock's going from 37 in November to $7 today. That's a pathetic 81% decline. And what do we have to show for it? Beats me. Now, how can you not like an energy storage solutions play that optimizes the grid like Fluence Energy? Well, you probably don't like it if you bought the stock at 36 in November because you now got stuck with a $7 piece of paper. Eighth, Go Health had already been annihilated going into November when it was only at $3.60. Now it's at $0.76. Cents. I usually don't talk about stocks that's low, but this is a health insurance marketplace, and I think it's a victim of volume. The brokerage firms pumped out too many health care IPOs that fit the COVID theme to help you navigate the thicket of health care laws. Can't say too much, though, because it's too small. Ninth, Wayfair, online furniture retailer, consummate pandemic play, struggling as the world goes back to normal. The most recent quarter was terrible. The stock has plunged from 258 to 52. Hideous. I honestly don't know what to do with this company other than sell it, because I can't figure out what could help them be turned around. Before the pandemic, Wayfair looked broken. I think it looks be- broken again. Number 10, I never liked Novavax. This has historically not been a successful vaccine developer, and I figured they'd have an also ran against COVID, even as they repeatedly told us they were at the head of the, of the pack. Lots of people believe them. That's how the stock got bid up to 258 in November. But now the believers have vanished, which is why it's come down to 42. I think it's got more downside, given that it was in the single digits for ages for the pandemic. Number 11 is Fastly had such promise because it had the best Internet technology to host some terrific clients. But the business slowed, had a bad outage, and now it's fallen from 41 to 10, down 75 percent. Again, I don't know. Maybe it can be taken over. I have nothing. I don't I don't have a reason. Finally, let's not forget about Netflix, which has fallen from 659 in November to 166 today. You could argue it's now gotten cheaper versus the subscriber count. But we don't know if the business will keep deteriorating too much competition. These beaten down stocks can all be bolstered by M&A, but it sure hasn't happened yet. They can potentially innovate their way out of this dilemma. But what I care about is all of this wealth destruction makes those stocks the trump cards in J-PAL's war against inflation. The losses in these names represent the extra vacation, the new roof, the fancy dinner, the staircase, the kitchen remodeling, the bath remodeling, the nice clothes. Now they're all going to be stopped. The losses slow the economy. This is a rogues gallery of losers that's expanding every day. Like tonight, when one of my favorites, Dutch Bros, took my breath away with a terrible number when they had been going like bad. Miserable. Same with almost all the IPOs in the SPACs. Their declines are part of the right of the fight against inflation. And for who knows? You know, I haven't talked about systemic risk in a long time. But when you look at what's going on with stablecoin, you start thinking, all right, I see why a lot of people want to get out. Sadly, for our portfolios, including my charitable trust, things aren't working. I get that. It's ugly. It's painful. But the bottom line is, it's exactly what the Fed needs on still one more day where a government inflation figure is just too darn hot. One day this will end, and we will look back and find, even on this list, some great bargains. But right now, you can pick at losers and be patient. For the most part, though, patience is decidedly in this business not a virtue. Let's go to Betsy in California, please. Betsy. Well, Jim, there is one way that patience is a virtue, and that is if you read Kramer's books and you figured out that there's always a bull market somewhere. Well, uh, thank you so much. What is the opposite, Jim? What's the opposite side of Apple? You know what it is? No. It's it's Hershey. Because because Apple's lost 17, whatever, and Hershey's up. Well, you know why Hershey's up, Betsy? Because uh, uh, there's a person by the name of Michelle Buck who runs it. And I had the privilege of pulling up with her. She is so smart. She totally understood what this company needed to do. And we should be grateful that she's there running that company. And thank you for the kind words. I'm doing my best. These are very trying days. My 18th year of trying to do this, trying to keep things together. It's not easy, but we will figure it out together. We always have and we always will. Michael in Delaware. Michael. Hey, Jim. How's it going? All right. How are you? 
Oh, I had better starts to the year, let me tell you. All right. But I'm calling about Bosch Health. Uh, I've seen companies get cut in half just this week. I can give you two dozen of them. This one is another one. What should I do with it? I think this is being, mark? I, I don't usually like to make these charges. I think it's being manipulated down. I do not, I almost you never hear me make that kind of charge, but there's no reason for this stock to be where it is. I have told Joe Papa that it is kind of insane. There is no way that the parents should be this much smaller than the sub. There's no way that this company, which was doing that maybe there was like a two to four percent difference in what people thought should lose 50 percent of its value. My travel trust is sticking by it. You could say, well, so what, Jim? Your travel trust owns things like Apple. Isn't that horrible? I don't know. I've owned Apple for 15 years. What am I going to say? Blow it all out because a couple of bad days? That's not how I play it. It's ugly. It's painful. And it's exactly what the Fed needs. So it's still one more day where a government inflation number is just too high. And that's what's going to happen because good news is bad right now. Well, man, money tonight. Unity plummeted today on weak revenue guidance, even though it's a very good company. So are investors getting a buying opportunity in the stock, or is it just too late already? I'm checking with the CEO. Then I'm talking chips with recent dip with Global Foundry CEO. That is the most successful foundry in our country. And as Roblox hit a new roadblock in this market, or could after this dramatic decline, it time has come. Let's sit down with a very level-headed CEO and figure out what to do with a company that has $3 billion in cash and a heck of a lot of cash flow. So stay with Kramer. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on Twitter. Have a question? Tweet Kramer. Hashtag Mad Tweets. Send Jim an email to madmoney at CNBC.com or give us a call at 1-800-743-CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com.